Uh, first, I'd just like to say I'm so honored to be here today sharing space virtually with all of you. Um, just to do a quick intro, Tansi Kalista Dishnakoshun, Invermere Newikin, Cochrane, Alberta, Ustinia, and Fem Otipemiswak Nia. So hello everyone and Tawa, Tawa, welcome. Um, my name is Callista. I uh, reside in Invermere, BC on the traditional and shared territories of the Sakwapem and the Tanaha people and the chosen home of the Columbia Valley Métis Association. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I own Avalili Permaculture and the Earth Skills Institute. And through that, um, I, I do quite a bit of work with um, a number of different nations and organizations across BC um, helping with educational pieces for food sovereignty and food security, as well as planning and consulting and design services for food systems. Um, aside from the, the permaculture side of thing and the food systems pieces, I also do, um, you know, quite a bit of the, the earth skill side of things, which is teaching a lot of those traditional skills uh, that are, are largely being lost today. So trying to revive some of those um, cultural aspects um, and, and reskilling people across the land. So that's kind of me in a nutshell, um, or my work in a nutshell, rather. Um, a little bit on the personal side, I'm a mom of three. Uh, my partner is Inuit, and uh, we have a one-year-old and a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. So it's a little bit crazy over here sometimes. Um, I have a little homestead here in Invermere where I grow all kinds of things. I have um, some chickens and ducks and a big couple of big gardens and a greenhouse and a food forest. So I dabble in a few different things. Um, we also have composting systems and rainwater irrigation systems. So a little bit of everything over here. So today, I'm just going to pull up my slideshow. Today, we're talking about seed saving. And I don't want to uh, take up any more time talking about myself. So <laughs> the show here, go to our slideshow. Come on, load from the beginning. All right. So let's talk about seed saving. First, we're going to talk about why. Why would we want to save seeds? Um, seed saving means that you're going to end up with seed, seed sovereignty. And seed sovereignty is kind of like the equivalent to food sovereignty and resiliency in food systems. Um, meaning that you have, you know, these resources available to you without having to rely on external sources for them. So that creates a lot of resiliency in your food system. Seed security is another thing um, which goes hand in hand with seed sovereignty. So seed security just means that you have seeds on hand to provide to community. And that, that could be seed security in a, on a local, small local basis or a larger regional basis. Or even, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, seed banks and those larger organizations um, on a national basis or even fur further across the continent, right? Um, Turtle Island. So everybody if everybody saves a little bit of seeds and we can trade and share like we did traditionally that is a, a huge uh, piece for seed security and seed sovereignty um, another thing is you can boycott corporate seed ownership so this is a huge topic and i'm not going to get into it too much but there are companies out there who have patented seeds and are selling them as a you know they have ownership over those seeds and um they take legal action against people who unknowingly or unwittingly grow those same seeds. Most of these are GMO seeds, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but by having your own seed production and saving your own seeds, you're essentially boycotting that whole system. Because in my opinion, seeds don't belong to people or companies. They belong to the land and, and should be shared through communities. Another reason to save seeds is from that uh, climate perspective and environmental perspective of reducing the impacts from packaging seeds, shipping them all over the place, um, growing seeds in other places and taking up land just for the sake of seed production. Why not um, grow those things, you know, vegetables and seeds together? It's they're occupying the same space. It's not taking up any extra. You're not, you know, burning fossil fuels, shipping seeds all over the place. Um, and, and, you know, more energy creating packaging and the rest of that. 
Another cool reason to save seeds is because you can create your own varieties. You can create varieties best suited to your specific local growing conditions, uh, and therefore they'll be more successful over a few generations. Uh, you can create your own hybrid varieties, and there's a number of reasons why you'd want to do that. I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, and you can create your own heirloom varieties, um, which is a really neat way to commemorate um, people or places or communities. Um, and then there's always this opportunity to diversify income streams to support a, a food system operations, right? So like a nonprofit enterprise, um, there's so many different ways that you can, you can create income streams to support food systems and create less reliance on things like grants. Um, producing seed is one of those things. So from a cultural aspect, some reasons to save seeds are to rebuild a close relationship with our plant relations and ancestors. Um, oops. So this is like reconciliation with the land. Indigenous people have been caretakers of seeds for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, corn, squash, and beans, affectionately known as the Three Sisters, were grown and traded on Turtle Island by ancestors many, many years ago and have been done for a long time. So just rebuilding those connections, right? So it's really important to know your plant relations before you get started in your seed saving journey. Um, there's a couple of really important things to know about. Many garden varieties are in fact the same species of plant. Um, and people have just taken those that one plant and selectively bred it and therefore modified it uh, to have certain dominant characteristics. And this is important to know because, well, I'll get there in one second. This is, this is important to know um, for a number of different reasons. Um, so here's just one example of this. Uh, a wild mustard plant would have been like the, the sort of uh, plant that all of these other garden varieties were based off of. So they're all the same species, Brassica oleraceae, but because they were selectively bred, um, for specific features or characteristics, they have now turned into different garden varieties. So cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, they all come from the same plant. They're all the same plant species. They've just been um, selectively bred and, the, and to, to have certain characteristics. So cabbage was selected for terminal buds, Brussels sprouts for lateral buds, um, kohlrabi for a thick stem, kale for nice leaves, broccoli for the stems and flowers and same with the cauliflower um, and that would have taken a, many years for, to develop those uh, different varieties with those characteristics but once you know those character characteristics were achieved then the seeds were um, saved from those plants as they were isolated from each other um, to maintain those characteristics so it's it's important to know what your plant specific name is, your parent plant specific name, the genus and the species, um, because varieties of the same species will cross pollinate if they're planted too closely together. And cross pollination creates hybrids, which will not have the same characteristics as parent plants. So if you plant all of your different, um, you know, brassicas, we call them brassicas, these are things from that mustard plant. If you plant them all together closely and you're saving seeds, you might end up with like a brocky flower or a, you know, a kale rabi. <laughs> you know so they might not look like the parent plants and may not have the same features that you want because if you end up with a kale robbie you might not have like and you wanted a coal robbie you might not have that nice big bulb on the stem it might be kind of a sad looking bulb um just as an example but hybrids are not all necessarily bad and they're often purposefully created for certain traits so some people have spent many many uh years testing out different hybridizations, different cross pollinizations to create hybrids for flavor, um, for increased production, for disease resistance, whatever. So there's, you know, like food labs that actually test this. So they, the, um, you know, there's farms that that do this too, um, where they 
they purposely cross pollinate two specific things so that it's all controlled and they know what's what and what's being cross pollinated with what. Um, and then they they do seed trials to see how they perform in the field and whether it's, you know, maybe it has really good flavor, maybe it has extreme pest resistance or they're like heavy producers. So, but that, that only works for those first generation or we call them F1 hybrids. Um, so you could create your own hybrid if you wanted. You could play around with that and experiment with it and, you know, keep notes and do all the things and test them. So there are lots of examples of this. This is a seed saving chart. Um, and if you go online and do some research, you'll find some of these. This one is from Seed Matters. Um, Seed Savers Exchange used to have a really comprehensive one. And for some reason, I cannot find it on their website anymore. So I don't know if they took it off or if they've updated their website and it's just not where it's supposed to be right now. Um, but you can find lots of different uh, versions of this that have different garden varieties on them. Uh, but this is just one. So it gives you the, the um, vegetable or, on, or fruit, the garden variety on the left, the, and then it tells you what the um, family, plant family, and the genus and species name, which is the important part uh, of the plant, so that you can identify which plants are from the same species, and then you know that you can't plant those anywhere near each other, right? Um, this chart also tells you how it, this plant is pollinated, which is also important for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. It gives you the isolation distance. So this tells you how far apart you have to plant this plant from another plant of the same species in order to prevent or reduce that cross-pollination issue, right? So you don't end up with a bunch of hybrids. Um, and then Oftentimes these um, seed saving charts will also give you a number of plants that you should be growing in order to maintain uh, genetic diversity for that uh, plant variety and how long the seeds typically uh, will, will keep for if you've stored them properly. So you can see there's a bit of variation. Some things keep for a long time and some things don't keep for very long at all. Uh, like look at parsnip seeds only keep for one year. So um, yeah. And then sometimes they have other helpful tips in there too. Uh, but these are this is a really great resource to start with. Um, it's also important to know too, which they'll list often on these charts, if it's a biennial or an annual. And that's so you can plan your plantings to save, save seeds because biennials, which I'll talk about later too, they don't produce the seed the first year they're grown. So... It's really important to know what type of parent plant you have. Um, there's open pollinated plants, which will be true to type if they're planted far enough apart from other uh, varieties in the same species. And um, so those are ones that I would recommend is, is use an open pollinated plant variety for your parent plant um, if you wanna save seeds. And then seeds from hybrid parent plants are really hard to predict. You never know what you're gonna end up with in that second generation. They could look more like their parents and have less of those uh, tra hybridized traits, or they could be kind of a wild card. So you really don't know what you're gonna get when you save seed from a hybrid. Uh, I, I don't recommend doing that if you're trying to maintain specific traits. And then heirloom varieties, have a long history and have been passed down for generations. And they're often really unique or rare varieties or have rare features, right? Um, some of those, uh, like some of the squashes are pretty cool looking. You can find some really unique ones that are not common. Like if you went to most of the bigger seed companies, you wouldn't find those. So oftentimes you can find heirlooms, uh, like unique heirlooms with, um, and there's a huge market for this too. People love this stuff in their, their backyard gardens, but also just um, you can find seed companies that specialize in heirloom varieties and find some really cool stuff. GMOs. So these are genetically modified organisms. Um, genetically, uh, GMOs according to the non-GMO project are created through experimental biotechnology that merges DNA from different species, creating unstable combinations of plant, animal, bacterial, and viral genes that cannot occur in nature or in traditional crossbreeding. 
I don't recommend using GMO parent plants to save seed uh, for environmental health, spiritual and legal reasons. Um, kind of looping back around to that first slide again, there, most of the GMO seeds are patented. And if you get caught growing those patented seeds, you could find yourself in a legal battle, which is not awesome. So I don't recommend using those. Plus also um, just from an ethical perspective and a health perspective, I don't, I don't think that GMO seeds are, um, are a good thing to use if you want to uh, save seeds. So knowing how your plant pollinates is also really important for seed saving. Self-pollination are plants that will self-pollinate before, often before the flowers even open. These are things like tomatoes, beans, peas, eggplants, peppers, lettuce. Um, there's actually quite a few of them. And with these guys, it's a little easier to control cross-pollination. It doesn't mean that they won't get pollinated by an insect or something else, but it, it's a little easier to control the, the cross-pollination with the, these guys. Um, Wind-pollinated uh, varieties are definitely more susceptible to cross-pollination. Uh, you kind of need to ensure that there are enough plants for pollination because if they're depending on wind to blow pollen from one plant to the next, you have to have a good number of all of those plants in order to make that work efficiently. Uh, so probably the most common one is corn for this, but spinach, beets, Swiss chard, um, et cetera, are also wind pollinating plants. Uh, insect pollination, these plants rely on healthy pollinator populations, and they need to be planted quite far apart in order to reduce cross-pollination because insects can travel pretty far. So this is probably the largest group of plants here fit into this category. Uh, squash, cucumber, melon, broccoli, radish, arugula, onion, etc. So there's a huge list of these guys uh, that, that fit into this category here. So some intervention may be required to control pollination, especially in smaller spaces where you've got lots of different varieties planted. Some of these interventions can look like netting over top of your, your rose, bug netting, or you could clip bags over top of the flowers, like in on this squash plant here in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, you can also get little mesh bags to tie over top of your, your plant's flowers. Um, and then, you know, you might have to hand pollinate as well. So, I mean, if you have, if you have bags over top of your flowers, you're going to have to go in there and hand pollinate, right? Unless it's a self-pollinating plant. So that means, you know, you have to either take a paintbrush and take pollen from one flower and put it on uh, the other, the female flowers, take pollen from the male flowers and put it on the, the female flowers, or you can break the male flower right off and just rub it on the, the female plant. Don't get excited, people. <laughs> okay, so seed maturity. Um, market maturity and seed maturity are two different things. So market maturity is like, you know, when you would harvest a, a fruit or vegetable, uh, to send it to market for eating. And seed maturity is a little bit different because uh, some plants are harvested for, for market long before the seeds are mature, right? So you have to wait for some of these guys to be really like overripe or past like eating point in order for the seeds to be mature. So um, things like squash and cucumber, uh, those guys need to be way past ripe if you if you uh, know what I mean. So your cucumbers would go like kind of yellow and your your like zucchinis would be like giant and, um, you know, and hard and your winter squashes would be good and firm and the vine would be kind of dead. So that's when you want to harvest those kinds of things for um, for your your seeds. Um, biennials require two growing seasons or a whole year in order to produce seed. So carrots is a biennial. Carrots are one of these that require two growing seasons in order to produce seed. So when you grow your row of carrots, you can leave a few carrots in or pull them up 
and put them in cold storage or put them in a separate bed where you know this is just my carrots they're going to pop up for next year um, and they're going to produce seeds their seed carrots um, so you leave those in the ground or into in cold storage and plant them again in the spring and those carrots in their second season of growing will sprout up a big tall flower head and create and produce seeds so um seeds from dry fruited crops like peas, beans, grains, chard, broccoli, lettuce, carrots. Um, they, they're mature when they're completely dried out on the plant and, and are hard to the touch. They're not soft anymore. Um, seed selection and harvesting. Uh, before I pick anything, <laughs> I like to ask permission and give thanks before I harvest. Um, and that goes for my wild plants, but as as well as the the seeds in the garden. So I choose seeds uh, from from the plants that demonstrate the characteristics that I want to retain. So things like pest resistance, or things like production levels, uh, cold hardiness. You know, so there's different things that that you can choose to to select your seeds for or traits that you can choose to select for growing but um, this is how you kind of make your own varieties or make a variety that's really hardy to your local growing conditions so you choose the seeds that demonstrate the the best growth and best production and best flavor whatever those characteristics are um, and they're good and vigorous healthy looking plants uh, you want to harvest seeds from several different plants, not just one or two, and mix them together to retain that genetic diversity and therefore create more resilience in your garden. If you are only using the seeds from one or two plants, your genetic diversity starts to decrease and um, you, you end up with things like decreased pest reduction or disease resilience. So um, it's it's a good idea to try to keep your your genetic diversity up there. And when you're selecting the individual seeds, make sure you're choosing the plumpest and like ripest or most mature looking seeds. You don't want flat, thin, exceptionally small or shriveled looking seeds. You want them to look good and plump and healthy and hardy. So, um, just as an example here, these two on the right are nice and, and big and plump. Uh, these are seeds from a spaghetti squash. And this one, you can see it kind of looks like a little bit concaved in, like it's kind of flat and shriveled. And so you can see the side view. The one on the top there looks nice and wide and plump. And this one turned sideways is kind of like flattened and shriveled. Those ones are going to be less viable. And so it's probably not worth saving them because the likelihood of them germinating is pretty slim. Um, so you want these seeds that are nice and, and vigorous looking and plump. So they have lots of energy stored up in there. One, they'll last longer in storage. And two, they'll just be more likely to germinate and produce a healthy plant. So harvesting seeds from those dry fruited plants can be super easy. It can be as easy as uh, walking through the garden and grabbing a handful off of a plant and, you know, just kind of rolling it in between your hands to get any chaff off. Um, if they're damp, I, I really try not to harvest them if they're damp. Uh, try to get them when they're dry. So later in the day, if you're in a spot where there's lots of morning dew or mist, um, or if it's raining, try to go out on a non-rainy day. And if they are wet or damp at all, you want to lay them out on a, a tray. I like to use cookie sheets, but you can use a cutting board or any type of sort of flat surface and just spread them out so that they're not like touching each other and you can spread them out well and let them let them dry out. Harvesting seeds from wet fruited plants is a bit more of a process. The seeds have to be separated from the flesh of the fruit first and then cleaned off a little bit just to make sure that they're not covered in a bunch of sticky goo or pulp. Uh, so this is a spaghetti squash. Uh, of course, the, the inside is like all stringy and goopy. And so you have to uh, separate the seeds off of there. Um, and I'll often rinse them off too, just to make sure they're not covered with a bunch of goop. 
And tomato seeds or melons, you know, those are much more wet. You want to give those guys a rinse. And when you go to spread them out, make sure that you lay them out so that they're not like touching each other um, or they'll just dry together in a big clump. So you really have to kind of spread them out. And usually what I'll do is I'll spread them all out and then I'll let them dry for the for the day. And then I'll come and I'll squish them all together a little bit, gently massage them around a little bit and then lay them all flat out again. Um, and uh, just so that they're, they don't stick to the tray either and they kind of get turned over and you can dry different sides. Because um, if they're not like on a screen or something where it breathes from both sides, it can still be wet underneath for quite a while. So I'll stir them around a few times over the course of several days. Make sure that they're really good and dry before you store them. The, the drier, the better. Because um, if you don't and they're still moist, you end up with mold and then your seeds don't do so good. Um, most of them won't germinate if you get mold in there. So uh, making sure your seeds are really dry before you store them is like really critical. It's like the most important thing I want you to take away from this, this webinar is to make sure your seeds are good and dry. Then after you've got your seeds all dried out, you get to package your seeds. Uh, you can use paper envelopes, or you could put them inside of uh, mason jars or glass jars. Uh, I like to add a little dehydration pack to mine. And what I'll often do is I'll take a bunch of little paper envelopes. I'll put my seeds in my paper envelopes and then I'll stick them inside the, uh, the like a big glass jar with a couple of dehydration packs. And these are little things that you can often get, like if you get packaged foods, like seaweed snacks or something, oftentimes they have these little, these little dehydration packs in there and I just save them. So every time we have any type of food that has these little silica gel packs in them, I just save them in a baggie. And then at the end of the, the growing season, when I'm saving my seeds, I'll pull them out and put them in my jars for, with my seeds. And that just helps again, to keep the, the moisture down and make sure my seeds uh, keep for a long time. Another thing you can use if you don't have little dehydration packs, you can kind of make your own um, using a little paper envelope and um, dried milk powder. That'll also suck the moisture out of there. But if you use dried milk powder, I'd recommend changing it maybe after a couple of months just to make sure it's not getting yucky and moldy too, because as it absorbs moisture, things will want to grow on your, your <laughs> dehydration pack of dried milk too. Um, <clears throat> probably one of the most important things after you have got your seeds all packaged up is to make sure you label them really well. So make sure you um, put your crop type, your variety, the date, or at least just the year that they were stored. And then if you want to add any other useful information, um, go ahead. Just uh, the, the biggest reason why labeling is so important is, especially from a community aspect, is that if you are giving those seeds to somebody else, it's really good to know um, all that information so that if they want to use it to save their own seeds in the future, they know what what the the uh, genus species name is. They know how old the seeds are and therefore, you know, the likelihood of them to germinate. And then the the other useful info, like when you get a package of seed, I know I really appreciate this. When I purchase seed from somewhere for my garden, having some information about the variety is super helpful for me in planning my garden. So if I have a little bit of information about, you know, the growth habit of the plant, whether it's a dwarf or a creeping variety or a vine tomato or a bush tomato, or if I have, uh, you know, any information on pest resilience or what type of weather or climate it does well in, like if it does well in a, a cooler, wetter climate or a hotter, drier one. Those are all super useful tidbits for someone as a grower to know where to, to plant that and how to, how to um, incorporate that best into their food system. So labeling, it's super great. Then once you've got your things labeled and they're packaged up, you want to store your seeds in a cool, dark, and dry place for best long-term viability. So um, in the basement is a great place 
to store your seeds for a long time. But once your seeds are properly dried, and I mean like really dry, uh, they can be stored in airtight containers in the fridge or in the freezer for several years. But again, not all crop seeds keep for the same length of time. Some keep for many, many years, like tomatoes and beans. Tomatoes are like notoriously like long-lived seeds. <laughs> I can remember I had some tomato seeds in my big bin of seeds that I was looking through earlier this spring to start planting my seeds and I pulled out some packages that I was like oh these seeds are like five these seeds are like six years old I don't even know if they're going to germinate but I really want this one tomato variety so I'm gonna I'm gonna plant them anyway and I put like I'm like you know thinking okay well if they're that old then there's going to be reduced viability so I'll plant four of these seeds in each one of my little starter packs right like each little pot <laughs> and then of course all of them came up so Tomatoes are really good long-lived seeds. They'll last for a long time. And beans. Um, but some seeds are not very, very long-lived. They're short-lived. So things like carrots and onions and that rutabaga thing, those guys are short-lived seeds. And so the older they are, uh, the viability decreases pretty quickly. So if you've got some seeds that are a couple of years old or a few years old, uh, and you want to plant them, you can test the viability of your seeds before you plant them so that you can determine what your seeding density should be in order for a successful harvest. And the best way to test your seed viability is to just take like five to 10 seeds, throw them in between some wet paper towel for, you know, a week or so, and then, or into a pot with some soil and then see how many germinate out of those, those, if you use 10, 10 is a good number to do because it's easy to calculate your percentages if you use 10. So if you throw 10 seeds in, how many of those seeds actually germinate, that'll give you your percentage of germination and you can determine your seeding density based off of that which is nifty. Seed sharing. Uh, seed sharing is really important for seed security um, and seed sovereignty. As, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a one man effort. It can come from lots of backyard home gardens and farms combined can create excellent genetic diversity and different, you know, varieties. So, um, you know, share your seeds and seed banks are a great way to store seeds long term and ensure that seed security piece seed libraries are another more you know casual more local smaller way to um to to save seeds and provide them you know provide people access to seeds seed exchanges or seed swaps are always super fun um i know many communities organize these every spring and it's a very casual event where people can come with their seeds that they've saved and share them with other people. Uh, so you might end up with some cool varieties or some like mystery plants, like unknown hybrids or, you know, these you know, heirloom varieties that someone's been growing in their family for generations that isn't out there on the market anywhere. So these are all great ways to ensure seed security, build community, and preserve genetic diversity for resilient food systems. And we have a whole bunch of seed resources of, like, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to, to resources, but a few uh, resources I want to kind of draw your attention to. Uh, the Seed Savers Exchange, so you can find these guys at seedsavers.org. Uh, these guys do a great job with educational resources as well as actually seeds you can share seeds with people and get seeds from the seed savers exchange which is a really cool kind of online version of a seed swap and then the oregon state university has a step-by-step -step guide to saving seeds available on their website which is a really great resource as well um, and if anybody wants this resource page feel free to take a screenshot. Um, I can also provide this list uh, to, to you guys uh, via email if you want. Um, maybe I could send it to Bianca and she can make sure if anybody wants it, it can get out there. Um, bcseeds.org, bcseedtrials. Um, bcseedtrials is kind of a 
uh, program run by Farm Folk City Folk and the Bata Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. So these guys are all kind of working on this BCC trial thing. Um, it's a pretty cool program. If anybody wants to participate in it, how it works is um, you, you sign up, they send you seeds for free. You, the conditions are that you have to grow them as a seed trial and then report back to them on how they did um, in, and your what your growing conditions were like. So the point of doing these seed trials is so that when there's different varieties that are coming out, they can see how well they fare in terms of pest and disease resilience and how well they produce in different climates and stuff. And, and so then they can make better recommendations for people growing in different regions throughout the province um, as to certain varieties that work best will work best for them. Uh, so yeah, seed trials, they're fun to do. Um, Organic BC has some uh, seed saving and seed security resources on there. Uh, Seeds.ca has a wicked seed map. Um, they have a map of all a bunch of different seed producers across uh, Canada. Um, so that's a great resource if you're looking for uh, companies to local companies to purchase seeds from um, and what types of seeds they have available so that you can find the right sort of things that you want to use for your parent plants to get started. Seeds of diversity, uh, that's seeds.ca, that's where they have the seed map too. Uh, awesome. There's also the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance um, and they work uh, kind of one of their programs is the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. So um, that's <laughs> iskn.org. They've got some great resources and information there. Uh, the Non-GMO Project just has some information on, on GMO plants and what that's all about. And then there's the Canadian Seed Bank. So that's canadianseedbank.ca. And that's a great resource if you want to contribute or if you're wanting to get seeds. Um, and then for a book, uh, there's so many books out there. Uh, I just have one recommendation listed on here, but it's not the only one I would recommend, but it's The Seed Garden, The Art and Practice of Seed Saving. And this is a book that was produced by the Seed Savers Exchange. So yeah, that's that's my presentation, you guys. I kind of whipped through it a little faster than I thought. <laughs> like I talked a million miles a minute um but I would love to open it up for questions and and discussion that's from Calista that was so amazing so engaging you're such a powerful speaker and knowledge Thank holder you. like everything you shared just like especially for me like someone who's a beginner in terms of this but so wanting to know more and like grew up watching my grandparents do and it's like wow like all of these things that you need to know in order to do this is just incredible um, so there was one question earlier, but you answered it as you went. Um, and I see one more in the chat. And, and of course, we'll open to folks who just want to unmute and go ahead and ask any questions. Um, yeah. You see from Rachel is, are there any seeds that need to be chilled, tricked that they have been through winter before planting? Yeah, there are, Rachel. So um, we call that stratification. And it really depends on what you're trying to grow. I think parsnips are one of those plants that need to go through stratification. Um, this is more a thing when you start getting into perennial foods and less of a, an issue uh, when you're growing annual foods. So as soon as you get into perennial food production, uh, where you're wanting to start a perennial garden from seed, you need to um, put some of those through stratification. And I don't have like a comprehensive list, um, but also if you're a beginner, that can be really challenging. So maybe stay away from these <laughs> plant varieties as a beginner. Um, but things like Angelica or, um, oh, what's the other one? Sweet Sicily, those are ones that need to be uh, put through a stratification process or chilled for a number of weeks. And some of our native plants, like if you want to grow a lot of our native plants um, in, in as part of a, a landscape, those will often need to be put through stratification. So things like wolf willow, uh, buffalo berry, those all need to go through those uh, stratification uh, processes too. Um, and I see Michelle's got a question in there too. Uh, do you know if BC seed trials are for individuals or if groups can get seeds? Yes, I do. They totally allow groups. And, and there was lots of, I actually did one of the, the seed trials this year and um, they they totally take schools and, and all kinds of different groups. So yes, you can do that. 
Oh, sorry about the baby in the background. <laughs> no, hmm. our babies are welcome in this space and in any space. <laughs> uh does anyone else have any questions or comments or even just like experiences that you want to share if there's things that you've learned along your journey oh seeing oh seeing Bianca pop in there about satin flower nursery has also provided free native plant seeds to groups and individuals if you're interested in growing native plants awesome mm -hmm. I just wanted to um like say thank you because your seed saving workshop was wonderful it was a little late coming in and it's sort of funny. I was like just managing a big workload today or whatever, or every day. I don't know, probably like everyone else. Um, and I was sort of doubting whether I would be able to participate. And now I'm so happy that I did because of course this is important. Um, like it's important work and it's like such important stuff to like, like knowledge to pass down to the next generation as well. I work um, with youth services at Carrier Sakani and Prince George and we have a garden and um that's funded by iSpark, of course. And anyway, and I, it got me thinking today, like, oh, like this needs to happen like next week. Like we need to get our kids into the garden because this is, this is seed saving time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll definitely do that. You've definitely, like you just inspired me and sort of recentered my practice today. So I just wanted to share that. And then the, on a like sort of a more personal thing, my sort of first introduction to seed gathering or growing seeds year after year was actually like in the compost pile when something would grow back and I would be like hey like that looks familiar like that's the same pumpkin that I you know planted last year and then tossed into the compost pile or whatever so um I just yeah I was curious like what your thoughts were my thing is like I usually just let them grow because I'm so excited to see them show up and um but yeah it just kind of got me thinking about like sometimes like nature is so strong on its own that like we can put our effort in and we can do these pieces to to work together with nature but then it's also really amazing when something just returns on its own too so I just thought I would share that mm -hmm. thanks Kayla I'm so glad this knowledge is going to get applied like right now yeah and I I feel like I went through that pretty quick, so I hope I didn't blow anyone right off of their their seat drinking out of a fire hose there for a minute. But um, it's I just want to say like it's not a, it's not super complicated. It's actually a really easy thing to do, so don't feel intimidated. And like worst comes to worst, like what you you might end up with moldy seeds, and you just have to buy seeds again next year. But you like it's not a big expense to try it, right? <laughs> just takes a little bit of time and it, it's a huge con contribution to you know food sovereignty so I highly recommend giving it a try even if it's just with a couple of varieties or even just one plant just give it a try and I have a quick question because like something that I really enjoyed Calista was about like all the spiritual care that you talked about in this and even just like about seed saving being like reconciliation for the land like that really stood out to me and like I felt that um and it made me think of like all the GMOs that are happening now and wondering if if there's like advocacy efforts that are happening from like indigenous groups or others that like folks can support or like what that looks like and how it's happening so I don't have a, a huge list of organizations and it's not to say that there aren't out there um it's just that I haven't come across too many of them yet um I'm I kind of get in my own little bubble sometimes <laughs> I don't uh I don't have all the answers but um I feel like there are definitely groups out there doing advocacy for this um I'm not sure how many indigenous specific groups there are um but there definitely are some um I think that the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance is probably one of those um and you know there but there is a huge global movement against GMOs and seed saving and so when we talk about you know indigenous well you know they're indigenous to other places in the world so I know um, in India, there's a huge movement for this um, and, and in other places. And there's tons of documentaries that are available out there um, and resources, you know, available out there for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's a big thing. Right. And and there's been lawsuits even in, in Canada over GMO seed being grown because, you know, corn is wind pollinated. Right. And corn is probably one of the the biggest GMO crops that we grow here. Well, 
it, the pollen blew over the fence line. Farmer next door has GMO pollen on his corn now, and he's growing a you know GMO corn because he saved his seed next year. And the neighbors, you know, like Monsanto's suing him or whatever. Like that happens, and it's really sad and it's ridiculous because how can you, how can you can like it's it's nature. How can you control that? It seems so wild to me, but yeah, it's a thing, and and so there is advocacy around it. Um, and it's important that everybody knows knows about it and can advocate for that too. Yes, totally. Thank you for that. Because yeah, I remember when I first learned about it years ago and I was like, oh my, like this is impossible almost it feels like in some ways and just, yeah, like wanting to push back on that even more. But like, of course, this incredible work is happening in people's backyards and everywhere. So like definitely hope for it to not spread any further than it already has, right? Yeah. yeah sweet how about anyone else oh see someone in the chat from marietta um, from new hawk nation enjoyed seed saving i help with food bank and distribute food from our gleaming program and community garden a few years ago but now i like the connections with friends and family growing our own food and blessing part my children and grandchildren are engaging in growing their own food oh yay i <laughs> love that multi-generational food growing pieces are so important and so like work that Kayla is doing with carriers to canny family services things like those organizations that have those gardens that you know incorporate all of those different generations are so critical to this work sharing knowledge mm -hmm. um keeping it open for folks in case anyone wants to slide in with any questions or comments. All right. 